Okay, we're going to start. Hello, welcome. I'm Jessica Reichert. Um, I work here at the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority. I'm a manager at the Center for Justice Research and Evaluation. So I want to tell everyone um, that this is a webinar, so people are engaged uh, through the webinar as well as in the room. We have about 40 to 50 people in the room. We have about 40 people um, on the webinar. Um, so welcome to everybody. Um, I want to thank all the sponsors featured here. Um, those in the room, feel free to eat your lunch. And um, there's some desserts on the table over there to help yourself and some coffee. Um, we can send all the slides to everybody who registered by email after the event. So the presentation um, is on resolving the data wars and human trafficking. Um, the format will be, there will be two presenters. First, Jody Raphael will speak and then myself, followed by a facilitated discussion by Jennifer Green. We ask that you please hold your questions for the discussion session. And those of you on the webinar can type questions anytime and we'll be reviewing those for the discussion portion. First, I'm going to do um, introductions for the two speakers and the moderator. Um, the first presenter, again, is Jody Raphael. She's a nationally and internationally known expert on prostitution and sex trafficking. She's mm -hmm. co-authored three major studies of prostitution and trafficking in Crook County, including widely heralded interviews with 25 ex-temps and madams. In March of this year, she edited a special issue of the Journal of Human Trafficking that explores how better prevalence data can be obtained and deployed in efforts to eliminate human trafficking. And that is the subject of today's event. She's currently at work documenting the activities of parents and foster parents who traffic their own children in the United States. And this is me. Um, I've been researching human trafficking for over 10 years and was ordered a, awarded a Department of Justice grant to examine commercial sexual exploitation of children in Illinois in 2016, or 2006. Or, um, I've conducted numerous presentations locally and nationally, including at the National Criminal Justice Association Forum and the National Conference on Juvenile Justice. Um, those presentations are on human trafficking. Um, I've authored seven publications on the topic of human trafficking and two in peer-reviewed journals. And today I'm going to be talking about one of the articles in the Journal of Human Trafficking, of which Jody was the guest editor. And finally, Jennifer Green is our moderator. She's the policy director for Lifespan Center for Legal Services and Advocacy. She's also a subject matter expert in com combating violence against women. Jennifer serves as a consultant to the Office for Victims of Crime and developing specialized programs for human trafficking. Jennifer has a specific expertise on the interaction with and responses to victims by criminal justice systems. Jennifer was part of the team that created the Cook County State's Attorney's Office Human Trafficking Initiative and the Cook County Human Trafficking Task Force. So as a moderator, she can also be answering questions too. So um, now that introductions are complete, I will hand it over to Jody for her presentation. I should have been in the, uh, should have been in the on deck circle or whatever it's called. Uh, should I clip this here? Okay, can everybody hear? All right, thank you. Um, this is a, a new presentation for me, brand new, and uh, it may be the only time we'll be giving it, who knows. Um, so um, I am a little nervous because I don't even know how long it's going to take. I was at the symphony, Chicago Symphony, this past weekend, and there was a, I went to the pre-concert conversation, and there was a lecturer who had a PowerPoint presentation. He was talking about the music that we were about to hear, and it was a a really wonderful presentation with uh, slides and, and pictures of, of, of because it was all on, on Czech music. But he was so nervous. Um, and as I said, he's a professor at Northern Illinois University. How he could be so nervous, I don't know. And he had all these papers. And he kept 
losing them and he couldn't find them. And it was a presentation where he was quoting from all kinds of things that he wanted, wonderful quotes, and he could never find the quotes. So we all had to sit there while he was doing that. So I returned to the office and I tried to organize myself a little better, but I, as I say, I may have the, the same problem. Um, I'm going to, um, this is not going to be a lecture on, um, on, on um, trafficking uh, for for uh, on sex trafficking uh, per se, it assumes that um, all of you who, um, who are listening um, know what sex trafficking is and so on. Um, I am going to, however, talk. My theme is uh, is what is in this special issue, which is that we have had a lot of attempts to change prostitution laws all around the world, and um, data and research have not informed those um, those policy disputes. Uh, and that is because um, there are several factors. One is, is that we are talking about a, a, a clandestine illegal industry and it is very hard to get data about the number of people, as you all know, who are who are deemed to be trafficked. That lack of data, uh, it, it, conventional kind of data, um, has caused a lot of people who want to legalize, who want to decriminalize the sex trade industry. They want to decriminalize it absolutely and totally for customers, sellers, and, and buyers to say that there is no, we don't have a problem with sex trafficking because we don't, we don't have the numbers to prove it. Um, but in order to, le to decriminalize prostitution, they have to minimize sex trafficking. If sex trafficking is a, lar a large problem in the sex trade industry, then obviously decriminalizing it becomes problematic because that's a, basically a hands-off uh, um, on the part of, of government and law enforcement. So they have to minimize it. The, the other side, their opponents who want to don't are fighting decriminalization all around the world. Um, are trying to emphasize the violence and abuse and sex trafficking that it, we think is endemic in the sex trade industry. But again, uh, lack of data and confusing data has made that argument very, very difficult. Um, and when I was reviewing the situation with these, uh, seems like every other day I got some email about a campaign to decriminalize prostitution in Hawaii, a bill has been introduced. That's the first one in the United States. Um, but all around the world, these bills are being introduced. And then I read the position papers and what people are saying, and it's the lack of data is just absolutely, to me, alarming. And the misstatements of data, the misunderstandings about data, and the manipulation of data by both sides is very, very distressing to a, a researcher like me. Um, the opponents of decriminalization are pushing a, a model which is, uh, was, was uh, founded in Sweden in 1999, sometimes called the Swedish model, and it's now called the Nordic model. And I just want to be clear on the, what I'm talking about because that's going to come up constantly. The Nordic model basically decriminalizes uh, prostitution for the seller. The seller is seen as a victim uh, and so there should be no uh, prosecution of the seller. The buyer, on the other hand, is prosecuted to the hilt. And that is because uh, the, the Swedish model says that demand is the engine that drives sex trafficking. If we, had, if we have demand for sold sex, we don't have enough volunteers out there that want to sexually service somebody, 20 people a day or night, then we have to dragoon and coerce people into meeting that demand. So the Swedish and the Nordic model says we have got to deal with the demand, and so it comes down hard. And the Swedes, uh, the, the um, model has now been enacted in Iceland and Norway as well, so it's now called the Nordic model. Denmark is not having anything to do with it. Um, so the Swedes and the, these, these people up there believe that the people that are trying to decriminalize prostitution um, have accepted that the abuse of women is inevitable in prostitution. The Swedish model questions why any level of abuse of women should be acceptable at all. 
and it is trying to dismantle the concept of paid sex. But again, the, that is based on the idea that there is abuse and violence within the sex trade industry. So we go back again to data. Data ought to be able, you know, when this is being debated in Norway, Sweden, Ireland, or wherever it is, we ought to be able to go back to data to decide the issue. We shouldn't be debating this as if it was some sort of uh, abstract principle here. Data ought to be able to tell us what are the experiences of women who are uh, selling sex. Um, so these battles that um, I'm going to describe to you, um, I'm going to give you some details. Now, you don't need to take any notes because you have a copy of the article. Everything is in the article. For those of you who are not in this room, uh, if you go to the Journal of Human Trafficking um, for March 2017, my article is a free download. The rest of the excuse me, the rest of the articles are not. You have to have a subscription, a very expensive subscription to the journal. <coughs> the free download is you you click on the little green triangle. I think that's that's right near my article. It's not really clear that that's a free download, but that's what it is, and you'll be able to print out the article. So I'm going to talk about, uh, in, in some depth, as long as I have time, as to what some of these, um, some of these uh, issues are. Um, the, and I would want to start with New Zealand um, to, yeah, that was good. We got the slide, yeah. Uh, so now go to the next, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> I have an extra. Uh, oh, yes, okay. Um, but New Zealand, we'll leave that slide up for a minute. New Zealand uh, is a really good example of what I'm talking about. Um, so in the, the New York Times had an article in the magazine section, that some of you may have seen it, in which a writer named um, Emily Bazelon uh, was really writing the case for the decriminalization of, of, of prostitution. And she pointed to New Zealand, which has decriminalized prostitution, and said trafficking didn't increase after they um, instituted that law. And now the women in prostitution are able to control their own working environments. This was somehow empowering to the women. Law enforcement was off of their backs and so on. Um, one survivor who was interviewed by Baslan and her comments did not make it into the article from New Zealand was then talking far and wide about what she had to say about the changes in New Zealand. And she's a volunteer with the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective. She told Baslon that after decriminalization, unsafe sex practices and violence became the norm. I'm talking more about the everyday violence of gagging, throttling, spanking, hair pulling, rough handling, and hard pounding. She says there's been a notable rise in men's sense of entitlement and normalization of abuse since the new law came into effect. Um, her experience was nowhere mentioned in the New Zealand section of the article. What's frustrating to me is, is that nobody in New Zealand seems to be collecting this information, interviewing people in the in the sex trade industry and looking at what are the effects of this of this of this law and the the the, the lack of data in terms of proving what this um, Sabrina Wallis had to say is, is extremely frustrating. Now up here on the, the slides that are up there are one of our themes for today is that um, there is data. There is data that we can use and we're going to talk about, especially Jessica, some of the data that we can begin to use if we would just use it. And I've put up a few examples of some data. Now again, we cannot get a representative sample of people in the sex trade industry and then we cannot determine because we can't do it, it's, it's clandestine, and then we cannot interview them and see what percent of them are trafficked. That is, that will never be able to be done. So we don't have a conventional way of determining what percent. We do have, however, we're starting to get local studies. Now these studies I'm giving you, I think, three examples or four examples of some of these local studies that we can start to use. We, this Ohio survey of prostituted persons, that is Ohio, that's just the state of Ohio, 
328 people were interviewed, which is a fairly large number. And of those, 35% entered prostitution under the age of 18, and 13% could be classified as trafficking victims under the federal definition. So 13% of a fairly large sample. Now, I can't take that and extrapolate that into a national figure, but that just remember that 13%, because interestingly enough, in some of these local samples, the percentages seem to be about the same. Next slide. San Diego had a study of gang involvement in sex trafficking last year. And again, this is kind of an offbeat way, but they interviewed 46 um, men who were incarcerated in the San Diego jail, county jail, and 10 traffickers pimps out in the community. Um, and they found that 30, a third of them would qualify as sex traffickers. And of those, 80% were gang affiliated. But they looked, talked to them about how many females they were trafficking over their time before they got into jail. And they came up with a range of 11,000 to 20,000 victims who were trafficked in San Diego by these uh, very small number of individuals. And again, we don't know how many traffickers there are in San Diego, and we don't know how many um, people in San Diego are trafficked. But this alone, this is like, this is the, we should have a little iceberg on the slide. This is the tip of the iceberg, if you, but this tells you, hey, we've got a problem here in, in, in San Diego. Next slide, please. We had um, recently a 10 city survey of homeless youth, 641 youth interviewed at 10 co Covenant House sites. These are uh, service centers, uh, walk-in centers for homeless youth. Uh, 14% of the youth who were trafficked uh, were, met the definition of traffic. Again, that's very close to the 13% that we had over in Ohio. And the last slide, we have federally funded local trafficking task forces, and between 2008 and 2014, they identified over 7,000 potential victims. Now, not all these cases could be developed or charged and so on, uh, but they were, pretty clear that they had seven, and these task forces cover only 19% of the United States. Again, very difficult to extrapolate that and put it into the whole country. But I ask you as I talk about these policy debates to bear in mind some of this new, you know, th this new data, um, because we shouldn't really, sh I don't, in my opinion at this point, we shouldn't be arguing about the issue of sex trafficking. I think, and, and as Jessica's presentation will show you, I think we've moved well beyond that. But in these very current policy debates, we're, we're still back in the dark ages. Okay, next slide. And this is, okay, in public policy debates. And this is the House of Commons, uh, which is going to be one of our uh, venues for debate. All right, next, next please. Canadian Superior Court lawsuit. Where's the rest of it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I'm shuffling my papers. All right. We had a recent four-year effort to reform Canada's prostitution law. We had a court case. We had competing research allegations, and we ended with a new law in Parliament. Um, the Canada had a um, a law that basically limited solicitation, pimping, and operating a brothel. And some women in prostitution challenged that law as being contrary to Canada's constitution. Um, a local level court held a hearing, a many day hearing, and eventually wrote a 131 page opinion, took the judge a year to produce. And they um, basically said the law was unconstitutional, that the women were harmed uh, because the provisions about not being in brothels meant that the risk of violence was greater. They had to work on the streets and they couldn't work, they couldn't work indoors. Um, that lawsuit was upheld um, all the way up to the, the highest court of Canada, uh, which, took, which took many years. Now the, the hearing in Ontario, the original hearing involved dueling, dueling, dueling experts, dueling academics testifying. Um, the government 
trying to uphold the law um, offer their conclusions that prostitution is inherently violent. And again, in very general terms, um, nothing, nothing very specific to the to the Canadian scene. And the um, women in prostitution demonstrated how um, the uh, provisions of Canadians' law made their lives more more violent. And in striking down the law, the court relied on research data presented by the plaintiffs, discussing five studies it said was relevant to the issue. So the women in prostitution prevented, presented five research studies, which of course were not properly contested by the Canadian government. Max Waltman, who is uh, a sociologist in Stockholm, actually pulled out those studies and read each one of them. And he found that all of them were misquoted by and misrepresented by the plaintiffs and were misquoted by the court. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, the court said that one of these research studies found that street prostitution was more violent than prostitution indoors. But that's, in that study, there was no control group of those in street prostitution. And they could not make any comparisons whatsoever, and they didn't make any comparisons. Um, the, another research study persuasive to the court involved 24 persons with only 12 indoors. When he read the research, he found that almost half of the ones working in legal brothels gave troublesome accounts of violence, abuse, and unsafe sex. Um, and he found that this research was a, a slender, slender read in which to, to, um, to use. Um, and that's, I don't have time to go into all of these other studies, but each one of them was, 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 was totally flawed and should, would not support the proposition for which it was being used. But by 2014, Canada needed a new prostitution law. Next slide. So we have a battle royal royale of of decriminalization or the Nordic model. That was those were the two things that they had to uh, discuss. Eight hundred, and when, then we had the battle of the s petitions and the signing of petitions. So we had eight hundred worldwide signatories. Um, saying that decriminalization is going to lead to increased demand and trafficking. And again, these are academics from all around the researchers from all around the world. And then we had 306, so our side, my side, was much more successful with the 800. Criminalization harms women in prostitution. Trafficking has increased in Sweden since the enactment. Um, and the um, Nordic model passed in uh, 2014, November 2014, um, the 306 academics said that decriminalization was going to protect women in prostitution from police. And one of the legislators said protecting sellers from police was of no concern to lawmakers. It wasn't of concern to him. He did not want to make life safe for prostituted women. He wanted to eliminate all prostitution. Okay, the European Parliament is the next venue. Next slide. Yeah. All right, we have a proposal by Mary Honeyball, a London member of the European Parliament and Labour spokesperson for women in Europe, introduced an advisory proposal to the, uh, the European Union uh, for the Nordic model. Wanted all the states of the EU to, uh, to go with the Nordic model. Honeyball's brief her report on why she wanted this model what could could bring a researcher to tears in that practically everything in it was totally fallacious overstated and exaggerated you know and that's the problem i mean honey bell has her head on the right place but in her heart in the right place but she maintained that 42 million people worldwide are involved in prostitution when of course we have no idea how many are involved that could be too high, it could be too low. Um, she asserted that trafficking is closely linked to organized crime. Uh, it's an epidemic. More and more people are being forced into prostitution. She claimed that men, all the men who purchase sex, hold a degrading image of women and are basically rapists. I mean, it was, it was, it went on for pages and pages. 
Um, so then we had, um, and then she claimed that after passage of the Swedish law, Swedish police confirmed that the new policy has had a deterrent effect on trafficking um, in the country. So we have 91 signatories who then are responding to that data and alleging that um, it's all inaccurate and alleging that trafficking increased in Sweden since the enactment of the law and claiming that the law is responsible for the increase in trafficking. Of course, we had a total of 35 trafficking cases identified by law enforcement in Sweden in um, 2011 and the low was 15 in 2008. So we went from 15 to 35. So this is this gigantic increase that they are talking about. And of course, reported cases are not prevalence figures. It has nothing to do with the amount of sex trafficking that we have. And one would expect in this day and age that we would have more cases of sex trafficking in any jurisdiction since we are now understanding sex trafficking and working with it on a daily basis. Um, and then we had, um, yeah, did I say, and then we had, no, no, go back, yeah, yeah. And basically 75 academics signed a petition, shut down, shut down this violent um, coercive industry. Um, in the advisory, her honey balls resolution passed the European Parliament in February 2014, 343 to 139. But it wasn't, as I say, the, whole debate was just based on every faulty premise that you can think of. Okay, Amnesty International has a proposed policy which passes in 2015, as most, some of you know. How many of you know about Amnesty International? Just a few, all right. Amnesty International, one of the leading human rights organizations in the world, proposed to totally de decriminalize the sex trade industry. Um, they um, said consensual sexual conduct is entitled to protection from state interference. Criminalization harms those in the sex trade. The um, opponents said we, they should adopt the Swedish model instead. Um, in other words, if you're worrying about um, law enforcement and violence from law enforcement and incarceration of women in prostitution, the Nordic model provides that because these women cannot be uh, charged with any crime, but it insists on keeping the the um, the crime for uh, the customer who is driving up demand and is driving up trafficking. Now, Amnesty International um, has again to um, minimize the con position, and so it turns to in its proposals and its documents, it turns to research. And again, the re it's just really sad to see this type of research being put forward by a organization with this kind of, of reputation. Um, basically, they uh, cite a Swedish report that says, um, since the law was enacted, some researchers have reported that sellers have become more reliant on uh, third parties to secure clients. Uh, so there's more pimping and there's more trafficking in Sweden. So I, I'm learning from Max Waltman, I pulled out this report that they're talking about and there's no mention of third parties in the report whatsoever. Um, the author of this report and, and she cited throughout the Amnesty International documents, um, she, she interviews only 15 sellers of sex of whom most have a positive view of what they do. So she deliberately looks for people that are uh, have a positive uh, experience. Uh, and this is put out as, as, as research. Amnesty International research did its own research in four locales for this proposal. In New, uh, Papua New Guinea, they interviewed 29 sellers with no information as to how they were selected in Hong Kong, 16 interviews with no information about how they were selected. And basically, um, and then they interview in Norway, 30 sellers were interviewed, uh, and that's a really odd one. They interviewed them before the new law came into effect. 
So they missed the chance, if they had waited, they missed the chance to interview them after the new law. They don't, and they avoid Sweden altogether, which has had the new law since 2000. So we have interviews under an old, under a totally passe and old law, which, you know, basically um, stand for, for, for nothing at all. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, the Scottish Parliament Bill is still pending. Um, a member of the Scottish Parliament representing the Highlands and Islands in Scotland has introduced the amnesty proposal of de total decriminalization. And she rep rejects the Nordic model, uh, basically, um, beca again, because these people believe that there is a right to buy and sell sex. So that's, that's a philosophical underpinning. Otherwise, you could support the Nordic model if you were concerned about uh, women in the sex trade. And she has to deal, you see, uh, we had 189 comments um, for her law and 48 against. Um, and uh, she then responded to the comments. Under the Scottish system, you have to have this consultative period, and then you have to write a report explaining what you heard in the consultation. And she basically um, has to minimize the amount of sex trafficking and prostitution in order to proceed with her proposal. And she says, there is an inherent coercion built into our economic system to provide for herself, but this is coercion felt by us all, and it's not unique to sex workers. Various factors, including our gender and socioeconomic background, affect our opportunities and life trajectories. Few people have the privilege of absolute unfettered choice in their lives. So this is how she just, um, you know, basically ruined my day with this very flippant uh, uh, situation. Um, and fundamentally, um, all right, the next slide, which is even worse. Okay, so we have uh, the UK. We have, we have, we have, actually, so we have Parliament. And we have, this is, an, this is a general inquiry about whether the, the parliament in, in the UK should adopt the Nordic model in light of the fact that everybody is, is doing it. England, UK has been very slow to understand sex trafficking and to pass those kind of laws. We've had the same laws for years. So we have a special committee, the Home Affairs Select Committee of Parliament, to take a new look at, at all of the laws. And we have over 250 submissions, written submissions. They were holding hearings. And basically, the again, I think the submissions were the same old thing. Uh, you know, prostitution is inherently violent as opposed to prostitution is not inherently violent. Um, but again, there's no data that is presented about this as to what is going on in the UK, and it's just all of this. Um, and you know, the, and I blame the advocates, and I blame, I don't blame researchers as much, because the advocate, and I never do this when I'm talking about sex trafficking. Um, basically, you can make some very good feminist arguments that if a woman's body is for sale, then that is, a woman, woman will never be elected president, a woman will never be head of the CEO or anything because the woman is just then defined by her body. So basically, uh, and that basically, and that, and that when, when you pay for that body, then you're paying for the privilege of doing whatever you want to do to that body. So that's this argument that gets presented to the House of Commons, which is very difficult for them to deal with because they're not a bunch of feminists. Uh, and they basically, they, they, their minds don't go in that direction, except for some of the women um, members of parliament. But to make it even worse, um, so, the, so the committee throws up its hands and says they can't do anything with this because uh, they don't have any data. They said no data was presented to us. They commissioned some research reports because we can't proceed without any kind of data. And they thought that the disagreements that they heard were based on differing moral values on the legitimacy of prostitution. So again, the approach I think has been, you know, really totally flawed and has not been relying on, on, on research data. But to compound the problem, Keith Vaz, Labor Member of Parliament, who was serving as the chairman of the Select Committee, resigned from the post. 
because he was secretly recorded making payments to two Eastern European male escorts, even offering to buy cocaine for them, although he said he would not partake, and asking them to bring poppers to the Acid Nation. So Vaz is a, seems to be a regular buyer of sex, and here he, he is as the head of this select committee. So he was, he was forced to step down, although he is still in, in Parliament. Um, now the next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, this is um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, you'll be happy to know. And this is um, a publication from the Open Society Foundations, which is one of the largest foundations in the United States, run by financier George Soros. Anyone hear of George Soros? Is that an, yeah. 26 richest men in the world, according to Bloomberg News. Um, basically, this is these are the principles by which they are funding um, these organizations. Um, they are funding Amnesty International. They are funding Human Rights Watch. Um, they are funding any num num numerous United Nations agencies, all of whom are calling for decriminalization. Um, and George Soros believes that in an open society, you should be free to do whatever you want. It's a totally libertarian. And again, this has, to, as far as he and the open societies are, uh, prostitution is about sex. It's, 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 it's as much about sex as, as gay marriages or, or any laws about and policies about uh, gay people. In other words, this is about your basic right to exert yourself, you know, as a sexual human being, with no reference to uh, what is going on in the industry. Um, and I'll just read you some quotes um, from this document. Uh, sex work is not inherently violent. It is criminalization that puts the sex workers at greatest risk. So how do you prove through research what's, in, what's inherently violent? After decriminalization, sellers are empowered to assist on condom use by clients. Now think about that. I'd like to hear from people about that. Seems to me that if something is normalized and made legal, the, the customer is not going to have any constraints on him whatsoever. And I don't see how a change in the law uh, gives the seller any greater power over the customer. Um, they say that people in prostitution have diverse feelings about their profession. There's three basic feelings about their profession. One, many find it personally empowering and rewarding. Two, others find it a way to make a living. Three, others dislike it. I don't think dislike it is a good uh, rendering of what a person who is sex trafficked uh, would say about uh, about her predicament. Um, and, and lastly, decriminalization allows for effective responses to trafficking. Okay, if it's if it's now legal, they'll cooperate with law enforcement to identify pimps and traffickers. So basically, the Soros way is, is that um, we can get rid of sex trafficking by just re increased reporting. Now, of course, under the Nordic model, the women would feel free to report trafficking because they would not be criminal. Now, the, uh, the organization that um, Soros funds, another organization is the American Civil Liberties Union, which does very good work. However, on this topic, um, they and I have to part company. Um, basically, they, there is a lawsuit that was filed in Northern, Northern California uh, against California's law statute making prostitution criminal. So we've got the same kind of thing like you had in Canada. Um, and basically they felt that they feel that decriminalization of the sex industry will reduce violence. That's decriminalization will reduce violence. Um, they lost in the district court in the, in the first court and they're now taking it on appeal. I feel fairly certain that that appeal is not going to be successful. The lower court said that uh, California had a legitimate government interest in preventing violence against women and human trafficking. Uh, and they viewed the 
statute as constitutional. But again, to their, I read their brief to the court, their amicus brief to the court, and of course the plaintiff is a uh, strip club. So we have the ACLU is now allied with a strip club. Um, and they have two authorities forming the bedrock of ACLU's proposition that decriminalization reduces violence. And so I pulled out both of, both of those papers. And um, just take it from me because I'm just about out of time. Neither of those reports says any such thing whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the report from Nevada that they really lean on, um, the interviewers said that there was continual apprehension of violence in the legal brothel in Nevada. Quote, the persistent fears associated with disease and violence clearly take their toll. The structure of the legal prostitution industry and the culture of work therein are not immune to violence in any of its forms. That's what the researchers said at the end of their research. Yet they very blithely misconstrue the, of the work in their, you know, in their brief. So for the time being, I have ended my personal financial contributions to Amnesty International as well as the ACLU. And I have given all of the money to the um, Center for Defense of Battered Women in Philadelphia. Yay, yay. All right, now, so conclusions and segue to the next um, presentation. We need to present data. We need to, I think I made that point already, um, local data and we need, and we need to present local data. And here in Illinois, I think Jessica and I need to put together whatever local data we have and put it together in a very authoritative report that could be used by everybody. We've talked about this, but we have not, we have never done it. Um, readable and accurate and totally accurate. Um, now, these campaigns, the, the good news, and you know, I have been interviewing um, for years now people who are, um, uh, abused women, people who are rape victims, people who are trafficked, sex trafficked, and everybody says, "How can you stand to hear these stories? And how can you, how can you do this?" And I've never had a problem with that because the people are survivors, and they are working with me, and they are working to do something about the problem. And to me, that's a, a happy ending. In this area, um, this just drives me crazy. All of this just is crazy making to me because the. It's all, all of these arguments are just based on this absolute fallacious um, um, information. Nobody seems to be doing anything about it. And I don't see any road ahead where we really can kind of turn this around. But when you look at it, um, and I said this to Jessica the other day, these, these policy, these decriminalization campaigns have not been successful. The Nordic model is, is reigning supreme. Uh, France has, passed it, this Ireland has passed it, Iceland has passed it, um, Northern Ireland is considering passing it, um, so, and even New Zealand is talking about passing it. And that is because I think um, it's clear that what they are arguing does not comport with the facts on the ground and the facts that, that and, the, and most importantly, the facts that law enforcement knows. Law, is there anybody here from law enforcement? We we're supposed to have some. We one person. Okay. We know law enforcement knows. Law enforcement sees the 13-year-old on the street corner. Law enforcement makes a sting and goes into the hotel room and sees the pimp with the next door and the 14-year-old in the hotel room. So they know the reality of this. They may not be able to give you a lot of statistics on how prevalent it is, but they know that that it is a reality, and they know. You know, and they see victims with with cigarette burn marks on, and and broken limbs and and all of this. Um, and we have more and more victims who are coming forward, survivors who are coming forward and talking about it. So, I think that um, we need really need to encourage. Uh, we need more research, and we need more research with law enforcement. We need to be writing about their experiences. Um, we, 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 it looks like we have to prove yet again that um, violence is really endemic in, in, the, in the sex trade industry. I thought we had that proved, you know, 10 years ago, proven, but it is, that, that is, it is apparently, it's not so. But I think 
we can build on what law enforcement um, knows, and I think we we are being uh, successful. Now, we and as I said in the beginning, we do have data. I've presented you with four interesting data sets. Um, Jessica Reichert has done has looked at law enforcement data, and in her article for the symposium, along with some other data, she can show you some very um, important things about, about about sex trafficking. Yet nobody is using again on my plea. Nobody is basically using this data. It's right now. It's just sitting in our you know it's sitting in our articles. So I will hand this to you and the microphone. I'm going to put it down. Where's my water? Okay. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> it's great to, to hear an um, international perspective um, since we're always so focused on, you know, what, what's immediately happening, maybe just in Chicago, but. Um, good to learn from what's going on in the, the, the world. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, using uh, law enforcement data, and it's based on an article that I wrote with um, Dr. Amy Farrell, who is a professor at Northeastern University in Boston, and she's very well known um, nationally and internationally um, as a human trafficking researcher. So um, human trafficking was added to UCR, which is Uniform Crime Reports, um, so the FBI, in uh, 2013. And this is a big deal because a crime had not been added to UCR since the 70s, and it was arson. So it doesn't happen every year. Um, so being a part of UCR um, sort of legitimizes human trafficking as a real thing happening and something we should count and examine. So it's a step forward in the area of human trafficking. So there were two categories, um, and this, these definitions follow um, the federal law. Um, so these are the things that law enforcement were told to count. Um, commercial sex acts and involuntary servitude. Um, I'm not going to read them, but those are the definitions there to use. Um, so reporting um, into UCR is not mandatory, um, but most states do report to UCR. I think all states report to UCR, but um, not all states have chosen to report on human trafficking crimes, unfortunately, um, despite the FBI including it. And We'll get into more about how many states have reported. So there are um, issues when it comes to UCR crime reporting. Um, these are only crimes reported to the police, and this is you know hidden clandestine crime, as Jody talked about. So not everything comes to the attention of police. They're trying to hide it from the police. Um, it can be a measure of police process and procedure rather than true crime numbers, but police are actively looking for it and maybe have a task force devoted to it. They may see it more. And then um, NIBRS is the National Incident-Based Incident Reporting System, um, and some states use that, which has more detail on each crime um, that is reported. And then some states, uh, like Illinois uses a summary reporting system where they provide something to the FBI to include in their numbers, but it's not every crime instance is a total, some together. Um, so uh, in 2013, 37 states uh, use the NIPERS, which is a little better. Um, and then there's also a human error, of course. So Especially when it comes to human trafficking, it can be counted as prostitution. Um, police officers maybe ask certain questions and dive a little deeper. Maybe they'd figure out, maybe down the road, that it's human trafficking, but oh, we already counted it as prostitution. So there's um, those issues. Um, there can be double counting, false positives, just, just errors um, because humans are doing the counting. <laughs> 
So these are some problems with UCR across the board. Um, in particular about human trafficking, there's reporting issues. Um, in terms of victims, victims may not be self-identifying, hey, I'm a human trafficking victim, right? Um, they might not be coming forward to police. And there's obviously a lot of reasons why they aren't, whether they're being coerced and, um, or they don't know what to do. Sometimes if they're from another country, there's language issues, or they've taken passports. Um, and a lot of times, and um, Jody and I did some, some research in this area that uh, of 100 women in the sex trade, they, it was their boyfriend, or most of the time they said, my man is who's the person um, prostituting them and trafficking them. So they're doing it as a team. I'm doing it for him. He told me we were going to get rich. He promised me this. He said it, not, there wouldn't be any violence. So a lot of promises and things um, are well documented, at least in our research and other research. Um, so then that adds to the problem of an officer being at the scene and knowing what am I seeing here? Is this a domestic dispute? Is this domestic violence? Is this prostitution? Is this human trafficking? What is it? Um, and then for law enforcement, um, a lot of law enforcement have been trained to recognize human trafficking and know what questions to ask. A lot, of, a lot of them haven't, or they don't think it's a problem in their community, so that's not something we really have to concern ourselves with. Um, and so they don't identify or, again, misclassify. And then we're also working against these stereotype narratives of what trafficking victim is, that it's a, a young woman chained to the bed from Thailand or uh, the Ukraine. Um, so that's, when I see that, it's human trafficking. But what if it doesn't look like that at all? What if it's um, a girl grew up in Chicago with her boyfriend from Chicago and he's forcing her to do this and he's her boyfriend? So, you know, there's things that are against us, movies and media. We can talk about that a little later too if you want. Um, and I talk about the interpersonal relationship. So these are the challenges, but um, it is an UCR, so we're going to look at um, some of the national human trafficking, HD human trafficking, uh, reporting over time. So first, we'll get the number of states reporting. So in 2013, there's only 13 states reporting. And some 2016 UCR data is out, but not the human trafficking last day checked last week. So soon we'll have 2016, but um, 36 states were reporting. Um, the state with the highest number of offenses uh, and arrests, does anyone want to guess what state? Pennsylvania. I haven't heard it. <laughs> Texas. Texas. Um, I don't know why it might be there's a lot of labor trafficking um, happening, but um, Texas had 285 offenses and 101 arrests. Um, I just checked that this morning to tell everybody. Um, but then noticeably absent is a state like California um, that isn't reporting at all. Um, they have three federally funded human trafficking task forces. They have nine state funded regional human trafficking task forces, and they have a bunch of counties that have active human trafficking prosecution units. So you think their numbers might be strong, but they have not reported. So someone needs to talk to California. All right, so, <laughs> and there's other states missing too, but I thought they were noticeably absent. Um, so in terms of reporting, and, and in UCR you report offenses and then arrests. So someone you think it's, you may not have enough evidence for arrest, but you counted as there's an offense. And it's known to police. So if they know about an offense but haven't made an arrest, they're supposed to count it. So um, in blue, it, the offenses and red, the arrests, um, you can see the numbers are small, <laughs> but they are increasing. Um, so numbers are 964. Five offenses and 387 arrests, and that's for the whole country. So, and then in, this is Jody's great idea to there's a a hotline 
that Polaris International um, has that everybody from across the country can call in to give tips. Um, and so just looking at that data, they organize it by state. If you go to their website, you want to know a little more detail. They have a number of calls and then the number of cases they've gotten. And if you compare the numbers, um, cases were 7,572. Um, and then calls were, what's it say? 26,700. So I would think there's a lot of offenses and arrests not being, that are out there that are being counted in the UCR at this point. So let's look at Illinois. Okay, I'm the phone and just grabbing some water. Okay, um, so this, I did the same data for Illinois. So the number of agencies in Illinois reporting, um, zero in 2013, a lot of states hadn't started doing anything yet, so that's okay. But um, there's been a slight increase, 716 to 735. In Illinois, there are about 1,000 law enforcement agencies. So um, that's out of 1,000. And then looking at offenses and arrests, again, really, really small numbers here. Um, 61 uh, offenses and 28 arrests. And then looking at the hotline numbers, let's look at that. So in 2016, there were um, 609 calls and 190, it's really small, maybe 196 <laughs> um, cases. Um, so again, we're probably missing a lot in, in UCR to date. Okay, so part of the, the study that I did that um, it's included in the article, was um, an online survey of UCR program managers. Um, so each state has a program manager, and we have one for the state police. And we got 40 out of the 50 states. Um, and we asked some questions about um, human trafficking. So only 5% strongly agreed that police accurately report human trafficking. 12% strongly agreed the police can identify human trafficking. 25% said their officers in their states were trained in reporting. And the number 65% said they integrated um, human trafficking into their UCR reporting. Um, so anything else that stood out? Um, the seven states that talked about training, Illinois was one of them. Um, then we have Texas, Tennessee, Colorado. I won't read it. And then some overall recommendations from this research. We need to have human trafficking integrated in the UCR for all the states, not just 36. We need to increase and enhance training of officers um, in recognizing and counting um, human trafficking. Um, we need to incentivize reporting. Again, it's not mandatory, so there's nothing to do when states don't do it. Um, monitor data and hold agencies accountable. Oh, um, New York was also not reporting, too. And someone over there thought New York would have the most arrests. Um, so it's hard to make states do it. Um, possible to tie some federal funding to it, but. And then some recommendations just for law enforcement. I think I've already touched on a lot of these. Um, we did do um, semi-structured phone interviews with, um, with law enforcement in Illinois and Tennessee. Um, in Illinois, we looked at um, Downers Grove, because they actually reported some human trafficking. Um, which kind of shows that it can happen in suburbia. Um, and then Chicago, we talked to um, officers in Chicago. Those who are doing the reporting to UCR. Um, 
And from those interviews, we came up with some recommendations, again, enhancing training, um, more guidance from FBI. When, when they came out with um, reporting of hate crimes, they had a whole manual, and they did training. They wanted to make sure everybody knew how to do this right. They didn't do the same thing with human trafficking. I don't know why, but that would be helpful um, to make sure we're reporting accurately. Um, supporting the investigation of cases. I know Cook County has a unit, right? <laughs> but Cook County is different, big, and it focuses on human trafficking cases. Other smaller cities do not um, have people focused on that. And supporting the accurate crime reporting. Um, one great thing that like Downer Scrub did was they have someone checking all the numbers. And if something doesn't look right, if there was an arrest for a prostitution of someone under 18, they flag that. They look through the records. They see, oh, this should really be a human trafficking. And then they mark it correctly. A lot of departments won't, either they don't have the resources to do that or just don't want to spend the, the time to do that. So that was really great that they that they did that. Um, and I do want to mention there was just a recent poll of 1,000 registered voters in Illinois. Um, Southern Illinois University did it. And 28% reported that trafficking affects their area. And by 86 reported that there should be mandated training on human trafficking for police officers. So that's interesting. OK, so the final conclusion, and then we'll start the discussion. Sorry. I don't know why I'd be talking this one. Um, so UCR does have incredible potential. Um, we should definitely use these current numbers with caution. Um, one example I, I like to use is, is rape. So rape was added to UCR. Um, well, well, I guess it was in UCR in 1960. But there was an increase from 1960 to 2012 of 391%. Do we think rapes have increased 400% almost? No. The reporting has gotten better. And there's increased public awareness and understanding of what it is. Law enforcement knows better what that is um, and how to count it um, and how they're investigated and identified has approved. So I think like rape, um, sexual assault, Human trafficking can, over time, this might take a while, um, become better reported and we'll know more accurately what is going on with human trafficking. And that can help with what Jody talked about, about prevalence. Because um, if you use the numbers we have now, it's not really a big problem, right? <laughs> um, so there's room for improvement, and we should definitely expect more increase, increases and more accuracy, which is a good thing. And the other good thing is that Again, it is in UCR, so it institutionalizes the crime, and it's clarifying it is a real issue and not just some passing fad or moral panic, but it's something that the U.S. government recognizes as a problem. And now we can start the discussion. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer to moderate the discussion. There you go. We have to pass the microphone back and forth. I'm not going to stand at the podium because we don't want to um, waste extra time moving back and forth. So, um, ask first, are there. Uh oh. Did I just keep this? That's okay. We'll keep moving when we see this. Um, okay. We'll just keep going and see what happens. Are there any questions in the room before we get started? Yes, we have. I, on the arrest data that you showed, Jennifer, the, it's arrest for human trafficking versus reports of human trafficking. And those arrests would be of the buyer or of the trafficker, not of the person who gets, that's being forced into sex trafficking. Right. right. So, so the reports, cases would be, would be identifying those who are being trafficked versus arrests on your data are just those who engage in that traffic. So the question just for everybody on the webinar is to clarify a little bit more what the um, UCR code 
the difference between arrests and offenses. And that's the short that the short version of it, right? <laughs> right. Right. And what the audience member said was accurate. Um, that the arrests being counted are of the traffickers and not the person being trafficked, correct? Because according to those definitions, that would not be the person being trafficked. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Okay, so the question is, is, does any of the data come from Department of Homeland Security um, or other federal agencies? Yes, and actually in, in my article, there's um, ICE and there's some federal numbers that are out there that I, that I, is in the article that you can look at. But again, those numbers are kind of low and I can't speak to their accuracy, but they are being reported. And those are just federally, federal arrests. Any other questions in the room? Jennifer? In, in the Polaris case, what were the calls and then What made the call to the case? So the question was in the Polaris data, there were calls and cases. Um, and what makes a call turn into a case? And I'm not sure if you, do you know? Okay, because I, I looked on their website and I, I couldn't find exactly, I had the same question. Okay, Jennifer knows, good. <laughs> okay, so every call that comes into the national um, hotline is directed to two places. It's directed to local law enforcement and then a local service provider. So um, they may have many calls that go to the local service provider but don't ever go to law enforcement because the person calling maybe um, doesn't want law, law enforcement, perhaps it isn't an appropriate call. Sometimes there are parents calling and other people, so um, they are tracking which of their calls then turn, I believe, into law enforcement cases. Yes, but I would just add from reading a lot of their reports that the, those are not where she has the calls. Those are not every call coming in. They have, that is a, a calls of, of potential or, or pretty sure that they are human trafficking matters. Um, so, because they have many more calls than, you know, than that. So they have, by the information they have, they have determined that this is a probable, this is a, a good indication that human trafficking is going on. Uh, but a case then is, is something that goes, you know, that, go, that goes further um, and is, uh, is, is then investigated. But that's a lot of probable call, calls, um, you know, coming coming through. And then over since they've been doing it, it's it's, it's really added up considerably. They also have uh, survivors, the victims or survivors, whatever you want to call them, uh, call in themselves now and also can can access the hotline via computer. And they have had a substantial increase in 2016 from victims themselves. So there shouldn't be any, those you know are trafficking matters, you know, right there. So th those are definitely trafficking matters, and then the others are, staff is determining that those are probable. But their numbers are really adding up, and I, I personally think that's a, a database that more researchers should be uh, using and, sh and, and should be involved with. And we have a hotline here in Illinois, run by who? By the uh, Stop it, Greg. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know if anyone looked at their data. So there, there's um, the Salvation Army Stop It program runs a 24-hour crisis line as well, and they collect data. But they are also affiliated with the Polaris hotline. Yeah, that so that is who Polaris routes calls to um, for the service catchment area of a seven-county area. There was another hand in the room. So the, the question is, is, are there any efforts being undertaken to add 
human trafficking uh, questions to the National Intimate Partner uh, Survey that assesses domestic violence and sexual assault. I don't think anyone knows the answer. Is anybody in the room? Not anybody? I think that is. I've not heard that at all. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that right now. I well, I know you're, you're talking about the um, the Department of Justice survey. Yeah. Yep. Um, there is an on, long, ongoing process to improve those questions here, especially in the area of sexual assault. But they're looking, they are looking at everything. But what the outcome of that is going to be under the current budgetary circumstances, you know, I don't know. But I think that is a really good point, and that I think that the we have missed a big part of of this, and that's really. We tend to look at this as a domestic violence issue when it is really, it's both. It's, it's domestic violence, but it's, it's trafficking for sexual exploitation. And questions should be asked by, you know, everybody, um, whether it's domestic violence courthouse or domestic violence providers or, or whatever. And I think it's been absolutely, absolutely missed. And I think when we saw this in the beginning, when we were starting to prosecute cases, of sex trafficking here in Cook County and all around the country, if the if the trafficker was an intimate partner, then law enforcement did not realize it, it didn't view that as sex trafficking. Now like they do, you know, 100%. They they understand that that intimate relationship is what gives the trafficker the leverage, um, you know, to do that. But that's going to be a problem with the UCR, and that's why training is so is, is so important. I just want to add that's a bit of the difference, though, between the UCR and reporting and then actual charging, because often um, we're seeing cases that start as a domestic violence case and then turn into a human trafficking case. And so um, even though it may be reported one way, it's being charged a different way by the time the investigation ends. Same with prostitution. Um, so there is a change between what, what's reported and what's actually charged. Any other questions in the room? So um, I hear that training is very important, and that's the two way connection with the law enforcement, and that you have to network with the FBI, right? Uh, we work for uh, juvenile detention. So what would be a best way for us to actually get more education, get more resources, so that we can identify what's going on? Okay, so the question is that in recognition that better communication needs to happen with the FBI and more advanced training, what can representatives of the Juvenile Detention Center do to get that training, um, as well as become, you know, sort of better aware of the situation and what's happening? Well, you're... Yeah, I think you want me to answer that. that. No, I mean, you're office, but you're no longer there. Yeah. But, uh, the, the, what is it, the office, what's it called? It's the Cook County Human Trafficking Task Force is what I would yeah, recommend. Yeah, but Cook County... Um, the, the the prosecutor, the, the sex what is it, the sex trafficking, the human trafficking prosecutor's office, they do offer excellent training, uh, and the Cook County Task Force offers very very good training also. So can I just get so, specifics yeah. on that? Um, so if you go to the Cook County Human Trafficking Task Force website. Uh, they have a website. There's an opportunity to fill in what kind of request you want. There are actual efforts happening within the detention right. center, and you have service providers working in there and helping with all of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, so so keep doing that. <laughs> um, but I would say the task force is, is involved in, you know, some of the agencies on the task force are involved in that. I was, um, apropos of that, I received an email and phone calls from a, um, a uh, officer in the north, somewhere in North Florida who was uh, working in the um, uh, prison system. 
and they, of course, read the mail. The mail is censored and, and read, and they, by reading the mail, determined that one of the women in the, who was incarcerated, her, her pimp or trafficker on the outside, he was having her recruit mm -hmm. uh, other women who were incarcerated, and so when, and telling them, okay, well, you're going to be out in two weeks, I'm going to meet you, and, you know, you can make a whole lot of money, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there was a recruiting ring mm -hmm. going on, right, you know, which, which that they were able to, to break up. And I would think that your center might be to do this very, very yeah. same thing. Yeah, I mean, we're sim seeing those similar recruiting traffic, those um, recruiting trends nationally in schools, foster homes, juvenile detention. I mean, that's a fairly common practice in all of those sort of group settings. Did you have a question? There's a lot of, yeah, there are several diversion programs like that around the country, and um, there's one that operates in the domestic violence courthouse here in Chicago, um, but that's a pretty um, common growing national trend. Um, for those who are arrested for uh, solicitation charges or prostitution charges to then be offered services in lieu of a conviction, um, and those treatment courts are thriving around veterans and drug treatment and prostitution and lots of different areas. Um, and um, there are also law enforcement efforts that do that type of diversion immediately at the point of arrest um, so that they're never even charged with a crime. They actually are offered diversion before they're being charged. Um, and there are some models like that around the country. So I think I think both those both of those kinds of policy efforts are happening. Um, I, just, I, just, I, I need to clarify because that's I just really, for lack of time, the Nordic models have um, the uh, services are a really in integral part of the for, for the women in prostitution, and they have put um, large amounts of money into the services, um, so they can serve as a model for the services and how the services then can be accessed. Since you're, you're not subject to arrest, so you have to you have to do it a little bit differently. Some of the criticism of could the Nordic model work in the United States has always been we don't have any of this kind of money for services and we don't have any kind of federal commitment or even local or state commitment for this type of services. And so um, when so that's a legitimate criticism of the model. If, if we don't do something about that here, you wouldn't the model could end up Focusing on the customer and the the uh, law enforcement would not come in contact or do anything. It would be laissez faire with a with a woman in prostitution. So you you have to have your your service model. But the Nordic model is nice if they they've got the money, but then they're not uh, socking anybody with a, a criminal record, and they don't have to have a special court and diversionary and all this stuff, which costs money. The money is just going directly to the you know, two services. Any other questions in the room? So I have a question for you guys. Um, do you think that, or do you know if researchers are generally aligned with human trafficking efforts that are happening like the task forces and um, the policy making decisions? But do you think that should be happening and do you think that is generally happening? Um, well, I haven't been asked to be involved in any <laughs> trafficking task forces. Um, I know nationally, um, Amy Farrell is involved with the um, federally funded human trafficking task forces, but I think there's room for research to be a part of that, especially if they have data to share or access um, 
to samples to study. Um, maybe that should be happening more. Yeah, I think they're, I will go further, I think they're really disconnected. First of all, there's not, there's, in the United States, we don't have the number of researchers that we need. That's number one. And number, it's seen as some kind of a, you know, fancy academic thing that doesn't. But we don't, I don't think there's a need, seen as a need for research until somebody, you know, in the state legislature proposes a decriminalization or something. And then we're going to come up short because we have not been, I don't think we've not been doing research. We've just sort of taken for granted that uh, this is a problem and everybody is really thinking this is a problem and it's really going to be more of what we're going to do about it. So I think we need more researchers. The number of researchers we have is really, really small. And, and, and I think we're not prepared. So Hawaii has already introduced something. But, you know, in, in five years or six, Hawaii thinks that within five years, they, they think it's a, a long process, five to eight years. They think that law is going to pass. You know, we've, we've decriminalized, and they think marijuana is getting decriminalized. It's, it's a sort of a whole libertarian, or I don't know what, what, what you want to call it, but getting the state out of people's private lives. And so there's a, you know, I have a fear that, um, when, if the time comes when some of this stuff gets, gets introduced, um, and we see this, I'm sure Jen has seen this too, some alderman puts a bill in the, in our city council, and we, uh, we had uh, an ordinance introduced last year, um, which would really have, uh, uh, eliminated some of the laws that we have on, on, um, massage parlors and strip strip clubs and so on. Oh, strip clubs was what it was. And we had no research. We, you know, basically would have, we keep most strip clubs out of Chicago because of these very restrictive ordinances. And we think these are, uh, sub women are abused in these strip clubs and we think there's a site for young girls are put in there that are trafficked or put in there. But we had no research on this at all. And we were really scrambling to respond to this to this ordinance, and I'm busy in front of my computer researching, uh, putting together data from Atlanta and, and all these other places because we have no, we just have no local local research. So we're not prepared. Now maybe that won't happen. That ordinance got defeated. It came back up yet again. Got defeated twice. But uh, you know that could be a, a, a perennial problem, but research costs money, too, if you're going to go out and interview people. Uh, and you, you, people just can't do this on a volunteer basis, so, um, and we have no funding for this, for this type of research. So I think that it depends on, on whether you think this is going to be a problem in the United States or whether we're okay. But if we want the, something like the Nordic model in the United States with proper services, what is the basis? What, what can I give a legislator that explains what's going on in the need? I, 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 there really isn't anything. Leslie? I, I get a little confused about this Nordic model because I understand it decriminalizes the, the person who's selling sex from not being arrested, and it goes after the demand side. But that's, even in that situation, isn't human trafficking still illegal? Yes. Okay, so making prostitution, decriminalizing prostitution, both from the seller and buyer side, I'm just having a little trouble because trafficking is something different. I mean, it's, I understand the coercion connection. I'm sorry, it's not a good question. Uh, well, we need to I guess the question is, how does the Nordic model decriminalizing prostitution doesn't decriminalize the trafficker? No. Right, so the question is, is although the Nordic model decriminalizes prostitution for the seller, for the, for the, seller, seller, for the seller, it doesn't decriminalize human trafficking. Right. Correct. No. Well, and we're looking at a strategy to go after trafficking. It's really right. about just bringing people in. And them into the engagement. Yes, but all right. The thinking of the Sweden is and Norway is that if it is, if the seller, if the buyer could end up in jail for a, up to a year, yeah. okay, then um, that seller is maybe think going to think twice 
about buying the sex. So that cuts into the demand, and so it's no longer as profitable. So, 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 so the traffic trafficker basically, if he's trafficking somebody, um, with, let's say he's in, in, in um, Sweden trafficking somebody, he'll probably he won't he won't traffic them into Sweden. He'll he'll go to Denmark or he'll go some he'll go someplace else. So Sweden considers that they have eliminated they've helped to eliminate trafficking within their borders. And they've monitored uh, customer conversations um, and through wiretapping and so on. And they've heard conversations and seen conversations where people are saying, well, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to, no more Sweden, we're going to go to Copenhagen or, or, or whatever it is. Um, but that doesn't still, you, you still want these Nordic countries have still, there's still sex trafficking going on at all times. And you have to have a, a very strong, you have to take a very strong stand on it because you're still going to have some sex trafficking. Um, but that just gets to the question of how do you ever end up eliminating uh, this type of abuse and this type of coercion. Now the, what they find, and I'm just reading some of this stuff this morning, the uh, number, they've taken these polls and they ask men, you know, how many of you have bought sex within the last year? And they've compared 2008 to 2013 or whatever it is. And the men have, and it's, it's, of course a lot of them are lying anyway. You've got to assume it's not totally accurate. But the number that say they have bought has gone way down. And they feel that even if that's not accurate, it's no longer uh, normal. It's no longer, uh, you're going to be ashamed if you're saying it. So they're, what they're trying to do is, is to change the whole culture, which is maybe the best way to eliminate um, sex trafficking. But you're always going to have some kind of coercion out here in the world, and you really have to. And whether Sweden and Norway are fighting sex trafficking, I would say probably not as much as we would like them to. Okay. Um, that's going to end the, the webinar and the discussion. Thank you so much for coming. I do want to mention um, that the, we've been doing a series of these Lunch and Learns. The next one is going to be on sexual assault by researcher Sarah Ullman at U University of Illinois, Chicago. It's going to be late July, early August, so please look for that if you're interested in that topic, which is um, in ways similar to this one. Um, and the speakers will be here um, if anybody has questions after um, that you didn't get to ask. But um, thank you for coming. Great, great. Thank you.